Oh, great. Let's uh, let's go ahead and get things started. Uh, good morning, guys, and thanks for dialing in. Uh, my name is Alex Salton with the Retirement Plan Consulting Group. Uh, excited to bring you guys this informational webinar, uh, offering timely solutions for businesses during a time when every dollar matters most. Uh, this is going to be the first of a series we plan on offering on a quarterly basis, keeping up to speed with ideas that are resonating with CFOs, business owners, HR professionals, and many of our clients. Uh, we've got a great cast of characters today uh, on the horn, uh, zoomed in for you guys all to, uh, to listen to. Uh, if you'd like to go ahead and wave as I uh, introduce you, feel free to do so. We have uh, James McCoy, uh, CEO and founder of Budget. We've got uh, Chris Calderon, uh, Chief Revenue Officer of the Difference Card. And my colleague, uh, Damon Mara of the Retirement Plan Consulting Group. So here's on the agenda today what we wanted to hit on, uh, why we put this webinar together, uh, who everyone is, their respective firms, uh, kind of strategies that are resonating with uh, CFOs they're speaking with, as well as small businesses, uh, what CFOs are talking about, and more or less how can they examine their overall business to find ways to uncover cash. Uh, we're going to try to keep it pretty tight on time, 30 minutes or less. Everyone will be speaking probably in the realm of about five to seven minutes. Uh, and uh, we'll try to, you know, leave a couple minutes at the end for a little bit of Q&A. Uh, so with that, James, I will, uh, I will kick it over to you to uh, get things started. James, the floor is yours. Okay. Thanks, Alex, and thanks for letting me uh, be a part of this uh, webinar today. And it's an honor to speak to a lot of you uh, today, and I want to share a little bit about what, what my company does and, and may, how it may appeal to you. Um, we're a SaaS-based budgeting software. We've been doing it since 2013. And we have several hundred customers. Companies range anywhere from like the middle market, 10 million in sales on up to about half, half 500 million in sales. And the bottom line is if you're budgeting in Excel and now we're in the COVID times and you're reforecasting, this tool is gonna help simplify that process for you dramatically. Uh, if you're still using Excel, you might want to explore some sort of a, a better tool out there than, uh, than Excel and it allows you to leverage your time and analysis better. And so that's what budget does is what we provide for our, our, our customers. Alex, go ahead and hit the next slide. And so if you've been budgeting in Excel, you've probably seen these kind of error messages, circular references, ref number signs, things like that. And so the idea behind uh, the budget software platform is to allow you to get out of the Excel hell that a lot of our customers uh, call it, not have these formula problems and be able to share the budgeting process with your stakeholders. So in any of your companies, uh, think about the HR department and just the, the budgeting of the, the payroll for you, uh, that process. You don't want to share that sensitive data in Excel with all your other users. A software program on the cloud can help relieve that, pro that problem. Um, so this process, I was a CFO. I did a lot of budgeting for many, many years. And uh, this, product, this product is a result of, the, of accumulating all the, the problems and, and creating solutions that you have in budgeting in Excel. And this is a result of that. And one of the other challenges to a decent budgeting software, is, especially when you're always reforecasting in these times, is, is having something you can rely on and that doesn't make you stressed, if, especially if you're in a board meeting and presenting a, a budget, you want to be able to access your data points very fast. This tool is going to help you. And lastly, it's going to be affordable. A lot of the budgeting tools out there, you guys are in the, the middle market section, small to middle market, and you go out into the, you look online, you look for a budgeting solution, and it's going to cost you 50 grand, 100 grand, and you don't have that. Your teams might be a little scrappy. It's just you and maybe a few other people. You don't have the luxury of, of spending 50 grand, 100 grand a year on a budgeting software, so you end up using Excel. Our goal was to, to kind of be in that marketplace where you guys are to check out maybe there's a way that you can afford something under $10,000 a year uh, that can really save you a lot of time. Go ahead, Alex, hit the next slide. No problem. So regular users can use this. That's one of the biggest uh, feedbacks we get. 
someone who doesn't know Excel, you're like, I can't have someone else help me budget this one department, this utility bill, or, or this travel and expense. I can't trust them. We solve that problem for you. You can actually have someone be trained in about 15 to 30 minutes, helping you play a role in the budget, and, helping, and then they can be held accountable to budget the actual every month. So if you think about some tool here, what we're offering is something that's affordable, saves you a heck of a lot of time, and actually opens you up to expanding the, the, the budgeting process to more stakeholders. So that was the goal for me to share with you that we can help simplify that process for you and save you a heck of a lot of time and increases the awareness of the budgeting within the organization. So at that, um, I'm going to pass it back off to you, Alex, to the next person. Great. Thank you. Uh, Damon, you want to go ahead and give a little overview as to uh, the Retirement Plan Consulting Group? Yes, yeah, sure. So thanks, Alex, and thanks, everybody, for joining today. I'm one of the managing partners at the Retirement Plan Consulting Group. For some of you here on the line, I may look a little familiar. Um, Alex is uh, one of our members now. has been with the organization for about a year, and we collectively tried to put together this uh, webinar now on an ongoing basis to assist um, you know, our clients and our peers with uh, some of the common themes that we're seeing in the industry in regards to the ability to maybe find some areas to improve either functions or provide some cost savings. Uh, retirement Plan Consulting Group, you know, um, retirement plan focused consulting firm, uh, been in the business for, you know, collectively almost uh, 70 years worth of experience between all four uh, primary members. <clears throat> And the team collectively manages north of 100 plus retirement plans at this time and approaching a billion dollars in retirement plan assets under management. You know, our market is a niche market, right? It's specific to one lane within the financial services industry. And so, like I said, you know, for many of our clients today, we're finding different areas as it relates to the retirement plan to improve efficiencies or improve pricing. And I know Alex is going to talk a little bit about that in a sec or two. Next slide. So yeah, my role on today's webinar is really just to make sure that anyone who's on the line and has not been made aware of some of the uh, resources that have been made available to you via Congress in the passing of the CARES Act on March 27th of 2000, 2020, um, basically what the CARES Act did was it provided, you know, north of $2.2 in financial aid to assist organizations during a time of economic challenge, right? We know we have the health concerns associated with COVID. We have employment layoffs. We have uh, business uh, in general revenue down substantially depending on the industry and so the good news was is that our government acted pretty quickly in trying to provide resources for organizations especially small businesses probably the best thing that came out of the cares act from a business perspective was the uh, Paychecks Protection Program, or what most folks refer to today as the PPP loan. And although I'm pretty convinced that everyone on this line is very familiar with the PPP loan and how it worked at this point, given the fact that it's already June 24th, in case you haven't taken a look at the PPP, definitely do so. Uh, you're able to qualify for loans amounts based on business size as well as payroll, um, and there's a formula behind that, but CPAs, banks, our firm can act as a resource and any assistance there. And also maybe some employers aren't aware at this point, but depending on what sector of the economy you're in, there are some additional um, relief programs available. So I know that you know folks uh, that are clients of ours that service, let's say the healthcare market, they're able to get additional economic assistance in it beyond just the PPP traditional funding. The one thing I wanted to take advantage of today, though, is that the PP, uh, the CARES Act was actually updated for the Paychecks Protection Flexibility Act, which specifically addressed some of the issues that made the PPP maybe a little less attractive than most organizations had thought. So if you haven't gone out and got PPP money, we want to make sure you're aware that the provisions have changed slightly. So, for example, in terms of being able to qualify for the forgiveness of the loan, originally you had to spend the money within the first eight weeks uh, from loan origination. Now you have up to 24 weeks. Uh, originally, you know, you had to use 75% of the money to be spent on payroll costs. That has been lowered or reduced to 60%, which means now 40% of the loan that was provided to you can be used for mortgage interest, rent, utility payments, uh, other functions besides from payroll. The objective of the PPP really was to assist businesses in maintaining employee headcounts and compensation levels. So forgiveness is going to be reduced to the extent that you were unable to do that. Uh, however, there was you know, there was a time in which you had an extension to go back to full employment. 
I, it was June 30th. Now that date has been extended to, uh, extended to December 31st, giving employers a little bit more time, depending on what industry they're in, to get those compensation levels back and get those employee headcounts back. So also there is an additional loan forgiveness uh, feature in which, you know, if you can document in good faith that you were in, unable to rehire employees or hire similarly qualified employees, um, and or unable to return to the same business activity due to federal requirements or guidance on social distancing or sanitation, uh, you now have an opportunity there as well to qualify for additional forgiveness if you're one of those entities. Last but not least, if for some reason you don't qualify for the forgiveness, you now actually have from 10 months after that non-qualification date to repay the loan in full if you'd like to. And then of course the terms of the loan were super friendly, right? Five year loan at 1% interest rate. So really just an attractive program. Want to make sure everybody was aware of to help you maybe with some of your liquidity needs or cash flow during this environment. Um, you know, I'll touch really quickly on reductions or suspensions of employer contributions because we do a lot of work in the retirement plan space. You know, I would say that a lot of employers did reach out to us in the first quarter asking, you know, what they were capable of in terms of reducing matches, changing safe harbor provisions, or anything associated with employer contributions. Um, you know, none of the legislation uh, that was related to the coronavirus included any guidance on suspensions or um, reductions in employer contributions. So just like it was prior to this event, basically, if, for example, if you had a traditional match, <clears throat> you're going to need to amend your plan proactively to reduce or suspend any contributions. And basically, you are going to have to fund any contribution obligations up until the point in which you amend the plan. So what we typically recommend in that situation is the plan be amended to remove any true up contributions, the proposed amendment be reviewed by the client's counsel potentially. So for you guys, if you have general counsel, if you want an ERISA guidance to take a second look at that, you can definitely leverage the resources of our office. We also recommend though a notification to the participants. It's not required, right? But from a strategic perspective, you know, something that is client drafted that indicates that the organization because of the economic impact of COVID has decided to uh, suspend temporarily or terminate the match provisions within the 401k or 403b plan, you know, ultimately we think that's a best practice. If you have a safe harbor, it's slightly different. You do have to amend the plan. You do need to put in some suspension language. You do have to demonstrate that there was economic loss for the plan year. You are again going to have to make, make do on the commitments that were already in arrangement through the year. Uh, and you will have to provide participants with a 30 day advance notice prior to the termination of that safe harbor contribution. Um, so it's really important that you give folks the ability to change their deferrals in a safe harbor match or safe harbor contribution arrangement. Um, last but not least, for most employers who might have what's called a discretionary employer contribution, where you think you have pure freedom and flexibility to turn on or turn off employer contributions, again, if you have a true up provision, you need to be conscious of that and make sure that you talk to someone about the impact of a true up contribution and discretionary match or um, employer contribution programs. And again, we would definitely review your participant communications related to cont contributions to confirm that in no way, shape, or form does this feel or look like an accrued or promised benefit that you're now taking away. That could be a problem even on a discretionary basis. So, you know, best practice again, a notice to the participants in advance of the impact is something that we would recommend. And again, just doing this maybe for six months or 12 months, depending on your industry and where your organization is at today from an economic perspective might make a lot of sense. For anybody on the call, the last one I'll touch on is defined benefit plans. Basically, one of the other features of the CARES Act was the ability to reduce or discontinue benefits on defined benefit plans in a prospective nature. And, you know, effectively, plan sponsors are now allowed to, um, you know, you receive this additional kind of relief, although it doesn't get you out of trouble in terms of having a pension plan or defined benefit plan, uh, you do not have to fund employer obligations in 2020. So for example, if you knew that you were at 87% funding status and you needed to make an X, uh, X dollar amount contribution in tax year 2020, you could actually defer that to January 1st of 2021. However, 
because you're deferring that, there will be additional interest calculations being made. So it's kind of like a Band-Aid, right? It will get you through calendar year 2020, but doesn't get you out of the, the additional, let's say, um, consequences associated with missing a funding requirement in a pension plan. So if any of the organizations on the line today are in that situation with a DB plan, you know, we've done some great work uh, reshifting or rethinking your funding models in the defined benefit plan um, uh, you know, space at this time, and would welcome an opportunity to speak to you a little bit more about your active or frozen plans. Alex, I'm going to turn it back over to you. Great, thanks, Damon. I'll uh, I'll try to be uh, pretty pretty quick to get us back on on time. Now we know we know you like talking, Damon. <laughs> that is this is uh, true. But uh, so I just wanted to hit on uh, stretch match provision. Um, so you know, for you folks on the line who don't know what a stretch match is, uh, basically. A Stretch match provision is designed to have participants save more money uh, by having you match a smaller percentage over a greater rate. So, you know, we have studies out there that show participants need to be saving 10 to 15 percent to get them uh, to that retirement nest egg they need, you know, once they go ahead and retire. Uh, basically, you need, you need to replace about 55 to 80 percent of your income, you know, when you go into retirement in addition to Social Security to be able to live, you know, potentially the life that you want to live. So what we have here on this slide is just going to be a stretch match uh, example. So, for example, if you're an employer and you're matching 100% up to 3%, you know, your, max in con your max contribution is going to be 3%, your average employee deferral about 5.7%, average total contribution 8.6%. Now let's say you go ahead and say, hey, listen, we're going to match you 50 cents on the dollar up to 6% because we want you as an employee to contribute more to your 401k. Your maximum contribution stays the same at 3%. Uh, it kicks up your average employee deferral to about 6.6% and your average total contribution to 9.2%. Now, what we're seeing is right now a lot of businesses are looking and saying, hey, listen, what if we bump this out and we do 25% up to 12%? What's that going to look like in terms of the average employee deferral and the average total contribution? What we see is that it, there is an uptick in terms of what those look like. So it benefits not only the uh, employee, uh, but it benefits the employer because Oftentimes, you know, you get to that double-digit range, you know, the, the participants may not actually be taking full advantage of the match, so this could offer a savings for the employer because they won't have to put away as much money uh, for their participants. But they want to reinforce positive behaviors, and that's the reason that they're putting this into place. Uh, lastly, before I kick it over to you, Chris, just want to talk about benchmarking. Uh, we talk about fees until we're blue in the face over here at the Retirement Plan Consulting Group. Uh, but we talk about the reasonableness of fees. Uh, you don't have to necessarily work with the lowest cost provider, be it the lowest cost advisor or the lowest cost record keeper, um, but we want you to be working with someone where you're getting uh, reasonable services, reasonable fees uh, for the service that's being provided. Uh, we recommend going through this process at least every three years just to make sure everything is in line. Uh, but fees are notoriously confusing, right? I and mean, we've got record keeping fees, we have advisor fees, we've got managed account fees, we've got third party administration fees, we've got custodial fees, we've got trustee fees, we've got an auditing fee. You could be paying for 321 services, 338 services, 316 services, can be billed to the employees, can be billed to the employer, can be billed via investment options, could be paying for flathead, per head fee, could be an asset based fee, could be a 12 fee, one fee. Is anyone else head spinning? It's, uh, it's pretty confusing in terms of how some of these plans are laid out, and they've changed over time. So what we hope you do is take advantage of us, leverage us. Uh, we can put together a fee and expense report for you, show you exactly you know, who's getting paid on the record-keeping side and what they're getting paid, uh, the advisor consultant fee, see how that plays out. Uh, if there are investment management fees, obviously, you know, what those costs are, uh, any managed account fees, we can put together a report for you which will show the actual flow of money within the respective uh, account. Uh, we want you to understand that flow, and then what we can do is help you benchmark it just to see how reasonable that is. Uh, so with that, Chris, I'll, uh, I'll kick it over to you to uh, talk a little bit about the different cards. All right. Thanks a lot, Alex. So uh, hi, everybody. My name is Chris Calderon from uh, the Difference Card. Just give you a little bit about my background, and then we'll jump into the product. But uh, I've been uh, in the health benefit space for close to 15 years started my career on the insurance company side with Aetna and Blue Cross Blue Shield. 
and I saw how much money the insurance companies were making and profiting off of my customers. And about 10 years ago, moved over to the difference card, which helps employer groups to substantially lower their health insurance expense without changing the benefits from an employee perspective. And Alex, why don't you just go to the next slide? I'll just give you guys a, an example. So our track record has been close to 18% savings for our customers off of their health insurance cost without changing benefits from an employee perspective. That equates to over $2,000 in savings for our customers per employee per year. So now more than ever, companies need to find ways to cut down on expenses to try to maintain some level of profitability in the current economic climate. And we provide one of those solutions to help cut down expenses, but still keep the benefits intact for your people. So our program keeps the same insurance company, keeps the same co-pays for your people. It just drastically reduces the fixed premiums that you would pay an insurance company. And I'll give you an easy example. Uh, a company would say 100 employees on the plan in the New York metro area is spending about a million dollars in health insurance premiums on average. Well, the difference card policy would bring that fixed premium down to the $700,000 range. And we would do that by buying a higher deductible option, which lowers your fixed premium by $300,000. And then you use the difference card technology and insurance system to make your employees whole. So this MasterCard that I'm showing you on the screen is a card that all of your employees would get. And they would use this card to pay the differences in the copays and deductibles so that the employees get the same exact coverage the company pays say $100,000 on average for the card in claims and premium. And the net net in that example is a 20% reduction in overall costs or about $200,000 back to the business that normally would have been retained by the insurance company. So a great way to find some cash in an environment where you need to cut those costs as much as possible. Alex, move to the next slide and I'll show you how the difference card fits into the health insurance financing spectrum. Most companies, especially small to mid-sized businesses, are in the fully insured space. And I'm just using Aetna on the right side of this chart as an example. A lot of companies buy a fully insured policy from the carrier. And that just means you get a bill and you don't have to worry about any of the claims expense. The insurance company pays all of the claims that are incurred by your employees throughout that plan year. So this is a very low risk environment, right? You just get an insurance bill and you pay that bill and then the insurance company assumes all the risk for the claims. On the flip side, the left side of this chart with United Healthcare or UMR, self-insured is what most big enterprise companies do. So you're talking a thousand to 10,000 employees and plus, they don't pay insurance premium they hire a third party administrator to just pay the claims for them and then they protect themselves with stop loss. Well, this can save a lot of money for a business, really low fixed costs. You pay a very small per employee per month charge and you pay some in insurance premium for stop loss, but the fixed costs are substantially less, sometimes 80% less than a fully insured plan. But you do take on a lot of exposure in that you're paying all of the healthcare expenses for your people up until that stop loss kicks in. So that's not for every business, especially smaller businesses. Um, it's a lot of cash flow risk that some businesses can't take on. So Difference Card is this middle ground medical expense reimbursement plan where you're starting to pay some of your own claims through this medical expense reimbursement plan arrangement you're buying higher deductibles and taking on say $5,000 of exposure per person. So it's limited risk, which frees up a lot of fixed premium. You still save substantial money, but you only take on a limited exposure per person. And that's why the strategy has been so successful over time, 18% savings on average. And we've never had a client lose. There's a guarantee in place that you will not uh, ever save any less than 5%. That's kind of the worst potential is that you save 5%, but on average, you're in that 10 to 20% range.
So substantial savings and a way to hopefully help you all through this tough economic time. So with that, Alex, I'll kick it back to you. Awesome. Thanks, Chris. Um, so I guess with that, uh, you can see everyone's you no know, contact information here. Um, I will go ahead and, uh, and leave that up. And we'll also be, be sending out a follow-up email, you know, obviously with everyone's contact information there. But I guess I will uh, I'll open up the line for, uh, for questions uh, to see if anybody has any questions. And uh, we can take it from there. Look and see if any questions are coming in. Doesn't look like we have any questions at this point in time. Uh, but with that, I uh, just want to thank you guys for dialing in. Um, Chris, James, thank you guys for you know your time today for joining us on the call and the partnership and, and all the pertinent information uh, during this time. Uh, we'll go ahead and we can we can wrap up the video. Uh, but thank you guys for dialing in. We definitely appreciate it, and uh, we hope to talk to you again soon. Thanks, guys. Thank you. Thank you. Bye.